Author Frederick de Bourg goes to the heart of our education system and calls for total reform in his new book, The Cult of Smart, How Our Broken Education System Perpetuates Social Injustice. He calls on all of us to embrace a new goal for education that would create a more just society through the acknowledgement of individual differences. Frederick de Boer, he joins us now to talk about his book. Frederick, welcome to the show. It's good to see you. Uh, thanks for having me. So tell us about the thesis of the book um, for The Cult of Smart. What is the ch fundamental change that you're advocating for that could, in your view, improve education? So the, if we look at the history of the American uh, economy, we see that in the last several decades of the 20th century, the American economy changed in a fundamental way, in a very important way, which is that um, uh, the job market for people who did not have an education collapsed. So previously in this country, you could famously get a job at the factory at the edge of town, and that would supply you with enough money that you could own your own home, own a car, raise kids, etc. That has largely changed uh, in the, the last 30, 40 years. Uh, it's really difficult now to not have an education and to secure the good life. So the policy apparatus did what the policy apparatus does, which is that rather than looking at some kind of structural change in terms of the government's relationship to its people, rather than creating a more redistributive social welfare state, uh, we said, well, we'll just send everyone to college. If everyone goes to college, then the benefits of going to college will be accrued by everyone. Uh, and that way we can make sure that everybody has a, a, an equal chance. There's two problems with that idea. The first thing is that if you give everyone a college education, the uh, monetary value of going to college collapses because once mm -hmm. everybody has that degree, it no longer is a way to make a distinction between you and the next worker. And the other reason it's a mistake is because different people have fundamentally different levels of academic ability. Uh, everyone has a, a, an innate uh, academic talent that they then uh, build on with work and with studying and with school. And so some people simply are not cut out for a college education or simply don't want one. And so the thesis of the book is that rather than continuing to try to push everyone into college, we should uh, grow the social welfare state so that people who are not equipped in the academics arms race can enjoy a stable life. Yeah. I mean, the way that I think about this is that we've essentially fetishized these particular types of intelligence that happen to be valued by the market. And then we feed this idea that, you know, that ridiculous notions like the skills gap or if we just all had a college education, this idea that we could all succeed when, first of all, there aren't enough job of those jobs for everybody anyway. And second of all, people have different aptitudes in different areas. Now, that idea is very controversial, right? It's very controversial to say if you take two kids, mm -hmm. you know, put them on equal footing, one is going to inherently have an advantage in certain areas than the other um, versus, you know, we could train everybody up to be good at whatever we wanted them to be good at. Could you just lay on some of sort of the research that backs up that claim? Sure. So um, the, the research portion is a frankly enormous body of research in the field of behavioral genetics, which um, attempts to ascribe certain portions of human personality traits to uh, 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 genetics, to your biological genetic parentage. So uh, they, they perform what are called kinship studies, where they take a look at people who are different levels of uh, relatedness biologically, evolutionarily, genetically. So uh, uh, a, a, a fraternal twins compared to identical twins, adopted parents compared to uh, biological parents, et cetera. And you say, can we use this information to make predictions about how well people will match uh, in terms of their academic abilities? And it turns that in f out that in fact, the more genetically similar people are, the more likely they are to share an academic uh, uh, outcomes in th things such as IQ tests or on the number of years of school that they complete. Mm -hmm. um, and now, in addition to the kinship studies, which have always had, like any sort of controversial research, have always had their critics, but now we're finally starting to do genome-wide association studies so that we can actually look at the genome and begin to associate specific uh, parts of genetic information with academic performance. And so we now have this set of confirming evidence that uh, is helping us to prove what the kinship study has been saying for, de for decades. So I guess the only thing is, you know, I could also see kind of what you're talking about here, and I do see this. Um, I'm 
people who are racist, right? Who will I love to talk about genetic differences between humans and IQ and all this, many of, some of which is real, some of which is bunk, but they love to emphasize all of this for a very different purpose. Do you worry that by legitimizing, or not even legitimizing this research, but by leaning into it and saying that's why we need social welfare, that you're kind of giving up a, a core ethos of actually we can all achieve something in America if you, if you work towards it? Well, I think that um, there's always going to be people who take legitimate re uh, research and distort it for the purposes of racism and bigotry. And I think that that's kind of inevitable. Um, I would kind of turn your question on its head, which is because liberal people, progressive people, left wing people um, have been so afraid of engaging with genetic research, they've essentially ceded the field to uh, in the popular uh, discourse to racists and arch conservatives and that, that sort of people. So mm. the the academics who actually do the uh, behavioral genetics research overwhelmingly are liberal and overwhelmingly don't believe that uh, the uh, that the difference in perceived academic outcomes between black and white are genetic. They think that it's like me, they think it's environmental, the product of racism and structural racism. Uh, but in the popular discussion, uh, it tends only to be the racists who are engaging in the on the f sort of discussion of how genetics impacts human destiny. And my argument would be we have to start to invade that space and to make the distinctions that I'm making and make smarter, better, fairer, less racist arguments about human genetics because it's not going to go away. We are entering a new era of genetic research. And the data that demonstrates that human behavioral traits are uh, largely inherited um, is only going to get harder and harder to ignore. So my my preference would be rather than say, oh, I'm giving cover to racists, I would rather say I'm attempting to take over to take back part of the field of discussion and argument from racists who have dominated it for a long time. Mm. And Frederick. What would your ideal sort of, if you were going to change the education system and if you were going to change, and I see how these things go hand in glove, the sort of social safety net system, what does that kind of idealized outcome look like to you? Well, on the educational side, I think maybe the biggest thing is simply a dramatic loosening of um, uh, restrictive standards and uh, and particularly harsh requirements. So uh, one of the things that we see in our education system is that math requirements, algebra requirements in particular, hold back an enormous number of students at both the high school and the college level. Uh, there are uh, some truly uh, discouraging numbers out there um, from various states at the number of, of kids who can't pass their state required algebra requirement. In, high, in college, uh, there are many students who go through their first year, can't pass math because they, they fail the class, they drop out. Now they've got student loan debt, they don't have the degree, and they're in really bad shape. Um, I absolutely acknowledge that mathematics are uh, central to human flourishing, but that doesn't mean that everybody has to know how to do pre-calculus. Uh, and if we acknowledge that different students are different people and have different strengths and abilities, then to me, it makes the most sense to widen the field, to make it a, a broader set of things, uh, of things and options that people could choose. So, for example, substituting a statistics class for an algebra class, I think, is a great idea because it still involves quantitative literacy and it will help make people better citizens and they'll still be able to engage with math in a level that might be easier for them to, to handle. Mm, very interesting. As far as... As far as the social safety net goes, um, I, I want a lot of the things that a lot of lefty people do, um, a child credit that is paid out in actual cash. Uh, the People's Policy Project has uh, talked a great deal about this. Um, is something that would, for example, uh, help uh, parents be able to set up uh, broadband in their homes, which many of them don't have right now, and it's kind of a crisis given COVID. Uh, but also uh, programs like a universal basic income or jobs guarantee should be uh, pursued so that uh, people aren't put in the position to say, I have to go to school in order to secure a job and I'm not good at school. I don't want to go to school. I'm not going to flourish anyway, but I feel forced into doing it. Yeah, really interesting. Very provocative. Recommend that people check out the book. Thank you so much for joining us and explaining it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have more rising for you after this.